So my question is um, how we could maybe adapt or, or do nature journaling with a kid who might be more inclined to be active. So, you know, if you're outside, the kid might be one who prefers maybe climbing trees to sitting down in nature journaling. Um, and so how to possibly adapt that or find a way to work with that kid's um, energy and activity. Um, that is a, a really great thought. Again, so you're, you're wondering about like, you've got somebody who can't sit still kind of <laughs> like we probably were and still are. And those, you got a number of these kids, um, either you're working with them solo or in a small group or they're part of your classroom. And how do you handle that? Um, let's take a moment, everybody kind of, if you have, so I usually, when I do Zoom meetings, I have a little notebook. Um, and in that, you know, I, I fill it with kind of all my thoughts and ideas about whatever is being discussed. Let's just take a moment um, on whatever little piece of paper you have in front of you. Everybody just take a moment and write um, just a, a couple of bullet points of thoughts or ideas about how you might engage um, somebody with uh, bundles and bundles and bundles of energy. We're going to take mm, about a minute to do this. All right, um, so you can either raise your hand or use the raise hand function in chat. Um, if you have your video on, you can just kind of go, um, or you can use that raise hand function in chat. Let's hear some thoughts and ideas uh, from, from folks who've got some experience with this or experience with kids and how you have problem solved that. It's going to be. <clears throat> Anybody? Oh, so if, if you've got something to share, just you can raise a hand like that and wave at us. Or actually just unmute yourself and start talking. Um, we can also, um, we can, um, we can also uh, use the raise hand function in chat. Oh. Um, here we go. Thank you so much. I am going to spotlight. Hello. Welcome to the Educator Forum. Good morning. This is actually my first time to be on this Educator Forum, so I'm looking forward to it. My name is Christine Dickey. I don't have kids, um, but I do volunteer work as a naturalist at CN Sage Audubon with children, and I actually worked with CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates. When I did the CASA work many, many years ago, we did some training, and they talked about the different way that people and children learn. And some people learn by writing, some learn by watching, some learn by hearing. There are also a lot of children who learn kinetically. There are people who learn kinetically. And so for a child that needs to learn kinetically, that needs to move, they need to move. So one thing is you would break the actual drawing into very short spurts, maybe just five minutes, seven minutes or whatever, but then release the child to move. And one way to have them move is go up to a tree and literally trace the tree in the air. 
and then a leap to the next tree and you trace the next tree or you trace the flower with your hand. So any kind of kinetic movement drawing in the air can reinforce the drawing in their heads. Uh, Christine, that's a, 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 a real, I can tell that the, you've had a lot of uh, real kid time experience. <laughs> Not as much as a parent would because I don't have any children. <laughs> That's, but but you know, you're you're talking about kind of considering different learning styles, correct? And um, um, I guess Howard Gardner did a lot of research on learning styles. Um, the idea was that kids would have a a, a, a mode that um, is particularly easy for them and to helps them connect. Um, and that so if uh, my uh, my my scoutmaster used to say that a a boy is not a sitting creature, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you know you do these activities and everybody say like I need you to sit down, be still, and do this, right? and 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 we're wanting to move. So you got to pay attention to who they are, where they're at, and um, incorporating opportunities for movement into it. Did I get your your key points there? Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's that's really solid advice. Um, the you know sometimes the group or the day um, or the individual is not going to be that conducive to what you had envisioned this nature journaling session should be like. Um, the and. If you try to fit a square peg into a round hole, um, you're either going to break your, your your board or you're going to mess up the peg. <laughs> and um, so, um, paying attention to the type of, of 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 pegs that you have and respecting that that's that's really useful. Yeah, and I think that you know if you find a child, for instance, who needs to hear or verbalize or something. You know, your other technique of drawing, which is when you look at an object, you out loud describe what it is. I see this, it is a rectangle, it has curved corners, it has a black box on the back. You teach that technique in your class of talking yourself through the object that you're looking at before you put pencil to paper. So that would be another technique to use with a child who needs to hear you know, they would hear themselves as they talk mm -hmm. if they describe it out loud before they actually put the pencil to paper. So, Christine, there you go again with uh, incorporating different learning styles. This is great. So, so she, she's saying, so she she's has, has you visual, we've talked before about drawing birds and how we have pat the bird. Yeah, so if you've done bird. bird drawing classes with us before, you know, you pat the bird, you're figuring out kind of the angles, you're kinesthetically kind of getting into the duck by patting this air duck that's in yeah. front of you. Um, you could do that, the same thing with the tree, sort of feel the tree mm -hmm. and, um, the and then she's uh, also suggesting that we externalize our thinking, verbalize what you see, and really leverage that for kids who may be more language learners or um, or, or kind of auditory things are a really good way of of uh, <clears throat> getting that in. You could also, if we want to incorporate more of of Gardner's learning styles turn that into a group discussion because some people, Gardner also kind of looks at kind of group interactions and things. Just sort of a, a footnote is that there's, 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 when Gardner first came out with the learning styles thing, a lot of people jumped onto that as saying like, oh, this kid is an auditory learner. And then they would kind of track that kid into that zone and at the expense of other things. And so, a more useful way of thinking about it is that a kid may have a more of a propensity for one mode or another, but that we actually all learn really well by exposure to these different things. So, yes. and, and, and so the, uh, you're not gonna be leaving other kids behind by petting the bird, right? right? And everybody's gonna gain from that. Everybody's gonna gain from the social interaction. Everybody's gonna gain from the more different directions that you approach something, um, the better off you're going to be in, in any of these educational programs. So that's really helpful, Christine. Um, the, 
let's see here. Um, can anybody, um, what, what more can we say about that? Can anybody add to that? I see Valerie's got some uh, comments either to, to dovetail into that or to take us in a, um, or to, to, to add to it. Um, Valerie, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I just have a brief comment. Um, one of the things I found successful with kids is before we start the activity or, or in the very beginning of the activity, I think it's really important to um, state the expectations, you know, what I expect from them um, in terms of behaviors. And I don't, I don't mean being like, you know, a Nazi about it, but just here's what I'm going to do. I need you to be quiet and listen to me for a little bit. And then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and kind of give them an overview of how things are going to go so they know, okay, if I'm quiet now and I hang in here for 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to get up and be doing something, you know, in just a little bit. So um, I just think it's a really good idea to give them clear, a clear understanding of expectations and goals and how things are gonna go for that hour or that day or whatever. Yeah, so a little preview. <laughs> like if we know we're gonna, yeah, that's right. So if we know we're gonna be discussing now and then we're gonna be playing hopscotch, right? Yep. <clears throat> the, the, the need in me to get my hopscotch on um, might be able to, like, I, I know that that need will be met. Right, um, right. And, and also if you're establishing yourself with a new group of kids, the more unknown there is, there's more potential fear there. The more that you kind of like, you know, you don't need. We uh, some people are afraid of like what comes next, and if mm -hmm. we kind of have that outline in our head, um, that helps. And also for kids with some more special needs, where structure is really important. There are some kids um, yeah. with sort of spectrum in autism and things like that, where where structure is really really important, and they need to know where they are in that picture. For those kids exactly what Valerie is talking about here is it's going to be helpful for everybody even more helpful for those folks that's really useful thank you um, thank you I'm going to um bring uh D Vitters um into this um hey there hi first time I love you you guys are great the, you're going to find that this forum is where the best conversations in this this whole kind of this, this, there, there's like really cool conversations that happen in this forum. So I'm loving I don't know it. if they're the best, but they're good. Well, thank you for doing this. Um, I was thinking the kids can act it out. Like they could be the bird. They could be the emotion of the bird. They can feel what that bird is feeling, be the tree. You know, is this an energized tree or is this a timid tree? And they could act it out. I, I love that. So what, what should I uh, call you? Do you go by D. Vitters? Um, or? Debbie the Great, but... <laughs> Debbie the Great. I like that. Um, I, I am Jack the Quizzical. Okay, um, excellent. Um, so uh, Debbie the Great um, has got some uh, really cool idea for you. Like, so if, if we're really needing to move, use that to your, your benefit. So part of what we might have to do is to give up this sort of mental game plan that we had. We're gonna walk out into the meadow and then everybody's going to find their blade of grass and we're going to sit down and we're gonna write haiku about it, right? That may not be what is happening with this group in this place on this day. Um, and you're gonna assess this group and if moving is really important, um, more kinesthetic, more acting things are. So as, as educators, it's not, our, our goal is to connect kids with nature and the natural world by any means necessary. And nature journaling is a great tool for that. And there will be some days and places and situations where that isn't the best tool to use. And some of these other things are, or some of these other things will set the conditions to then make it possible to nature journal. So if we're needing to move and kind of get that on and like, like how does the bird feel? Like everybody be the bird. Or all of a sudden, like, you know, we're, everybody's kind of after doing this for a while, you kind of got a sense of what it's like to be a coot, right? And then, um, and then maybe you're open to um, sort of discussing that with somebody and then putting that down on paper and then you've got your haiku. Um, so, um, Throughout your activity, you can modulate the energy level, the activity level of students based on where they are. So you're looking at your kids. Are these kids like, 
or oh, these kids like this, okay, if they're really energetic, then let's, so you, you're going to, instead of saying to them, I want you to come here and be in this mode, you're going to recognize where they are in their high level of activity. You're going to meet them there, and then you can direct go with them on a journey and direct that to other places. So very often, if I'm doing stuff that's out in the field, I will start with things that are really active. That can be, you know, um, you know, running around and playing games, adventuring, like climbing the tree, doing all those sorts of groovy things. Um, or a little adventure where you're going to follow me and we're going to go across the creek and we have to hop rock to rock to rock to rock, crawl across the log, go up the tree, down the tree. And you um, then, you know, everybody's kind of like, okay, this is fun. I'm into this. And then you get things that kind of take you down to the next level from this sort of very energetic to like, let's see if we can focus like, oh, look at this bug, right? And then you start focusing that attention. And then from that focused attention, you've got a place where you can, um, where, where you can go to, um, sort of for, for, for deeper connection and thought um, about whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, but you don't, you don't want to sort of start like, I want to get everybody out in the meadow, um, you know, looking at the flower and writing a poem about it. If they're not there, let's start with that, you know, acting, whatever it is. Another thing that's a, a great tool for, for really energetic groups, if you're doing stuff in the outdoors, is go for a walk. Oh, look, there's a hill, All right? Your program is actually going to start on the top of the hill. And um, so, you know, getting there, we've got, we're hiking, you're talking to people along the way, you're kind of getting your, you know, it's a big release of endorphins. And then when you're, you arrive on the top of the hill, maybe you're in more of a place for then starting to do something that is not quite as active. You're ready to take a little break. Um, I like your acting idea. Um, let's see. Um, um, Linda, I um, would love to hear your thoughts, um, either connecting with what, something that somebody else said or your own additional thoughts into this conversation. You're so good so to have open. you with us. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, last summer, I did an exercise with my uh, granddaughter, and uh, it was based on some of the things that you uh, say to do, like, you know, if you're looking at something, say it out. Okay. So, and she was kind of, she's a good, she's a great artist and she loves to do things, but she was really not in the mood. So I had to make it into a game. So like a, an I dare you game. And so kind of responding to where of, of Ivea was, you know, wondering about things. I find that when I make a game up that I, maybe I don't know where it's going to land. Sometimes it works out better than I imagined. So uh, I said, how about I, uh, we, you pick a bird? And she goes, okay, I'm going to pick a flamingo. So I found this picture of a flamingo in my many, if I turn my camera, you can see all these art books I have. Uh, I picked the uh, actual picture. So we'd be looking at a reference and I said, okay, uh, how about this? I bet, let's see what happens if we can draw with our eyes closed. Okay, let's just see what happens. So then we sit, I held up the picture of the flamingo and we both like for a minute, just said the things that we saw, long neck and pink body and Essie's head and, and, you know, black, you know, face and long, you know, knee and the, oh, that leg has his knee. And, you know, just, we just talk, 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 talk. And then after that, I go, okay, now this is the fun part, Bella, you, we are both closing our eyes and we're just seeing what happens on the paper. And to both of our surprise, it was like, you know, like, you know, when you do a blind contour drawing, it was, but it, but it was totally blind because it was like no looking at anything because you had the image in your head. And it was surprising and fun and kind of a great icebreaker because we went on to do a lot of other, other kinds of drawing after that. So anyway, I'm just putting it out there because just because sometimes nobody wants to do anything. And if you make a game like I dare you, let's see what happens. And you don't know where it's going. So the excitement is there. So, okay, that's what I have to say. <laughs> oh, Linda, I, 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 I wish I were part of that play with, that sounds like oh, a lot of fun. Been there. You would have been laughing your head off. It was so fun. <laughs> anyway, great. 
Maybe and, another time. <laughs> and, and, and also kind of, um, you, you kind of gave up part of the reins. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and let them take them. And that kind of connects, uh, I'd like to bring um, Stephanie Hardy in on this, if I could. Um, the, uh, and let's see if I can find where you are on my screen so I can also spotlight you. Um, um, Stephanie um, put a note into the chat that I think is really relevant. And um, Stephanie, um, could, uh, could we get you to, to, to kind of flesh out your thoughts a little bit more on, on this sort of student-led and, and student-driven elements? Stephanie? Stephanie may be having some difficulties with her audio, or I may be having difficulty with my audio here. Um, Stephanie, if if when you uh, if you are able to make uh, some comments to that uh, uh, about that us uh, real time, we would love to to hear that. Um, so the so a, a few ideas that we've got, oh, hold on I'm trying to do too many things at one time. And here we are. Um, another strategy is to use different sorts of nature journaling activities. If you want to be doing a nature journaling activity, have different levels of kind of gameness to them. Um, a game like the secret plant search, where everybody sort of spreads out in an area and you find a plant and you document it in your journal and you're drawing the different parts of it and adding little written notes and you're maybe making maps. The idea is that you're gonna come back together, everybody gets a partner and you take your partner over to where you were doing some of them, you give them your journal and you say like, like, look, it's down here somewhere. And then this person starts kind of looking around and trying to find your plant, your specific plant based on the notes that you have it. Oh, I found it, right? Yay, All right? And then you go over, they take you over to theirs. Now you're looking around trying to find theirs right? Finger puppets, they help, right? Um, and it's a ton of fun, but it's this nature journaling activity that's it's embedded in this kind of um, hide and seek game matrix. And it also involves social interaction with somebody else. So one of the things that I do is I will tell the kids when I'm, I'm setting up the activity, say like, if there's somebody that you really want to be your partner when you go and do this, make sure while you're taking your notes, you're not sitting anywhere near them because you don't want them to see which one you're doing, right? So those kids who are always distracting each other, whoop, right? But they know that later on, whoop, they'll get back together, right? And so, um, but but it's the nature journaling activity is embedded now in a game, and that is that's another um, strategy that seems to um, work really well. Generally speaking, when people have high, high energy, you don't want to, you don't want to fight that and say like, stop having that high energy because it's still there. It's just now bottled up inside and it's going to come out somewhere <laughs> and it might end up being disruptive to the lesson that you're trying to do or whatever your objectives are. So um, I will initially kind of ride the high energy bus because I tend to be kind of also a high energy person. And, but then I'll notice that through the arc of spending time with the kids, this is why I love being able to be out on an all day trip with kids, is because the day has its energy highs and lows. And individuals in that have their highs and lows. And when we're feeling really high energy, like after we have our snack, right? We're doing some, some ways of interacting with nature, high energy things are great. Other times we actually really want to be in a focused place and other times in a kind of a calm meditative place. And if you've got a whole day to, to spend with people in the field, that's great. Sometimes if you just have, if you're doing a program where you just have an hour, or if, let's say you're a classroom teacher, this is more challenging because you're now gonna take your whole class out. And just the process of getting people up and out the door by the time they're out there, everybody's now in a high energy, oh, we're going on a field trip state. And um, 
that is more challenging. That's one reason I really wanted to bring um, Gina Richmond in to sort of talk to us about some of her um, in the field experiences of doing these things with our, our, with our students. But we'll get to hear from her in a future, in a future workshop. Um, let me take a look again at the gallery view and see, is there anybody else that would like to add a thought, a comment, or an idea? Um, Deborah, um, good to have you with us. You're currently muted. I'm going to, okay. hey there. Okay. Hi, I'm an early childhood educator and I do a lot of work with nature, um, with teachers who work in nature preschool. So I train teachers basically at this point. And um, I, I'm the one who put the comments. Maybe you confused me with Stephanie. I don't know about- Oh, I, I probably okay. did. I'm, I'm dyslexic and when I read names that are near to each other, I'll like take this person's name, I'll put it in there. You should hear me read something out loud when you're reading the same thing with me. It's a creative experience. So um, Deborah, um, uh, really, thank you. Um, so when, when children are out in nature and I'm talking about very young children, like three to eight, let's say, um, they really I, I very feel very strongly about this, that they need to be playing. And that play can incorporate journaling, but it's sort of open-ended. It's available. It's like the journals are provided, a little guideline is given, and then the children, phew, and they work in clusters and they often do what's called contagious play where they'll cluster together and they'll teach each other new skills. It's, a, it's magnificent and beautiful. And so it's the, the teaching guidance part, I think is downplayed a little bit and children find their own niche and they find their own temperament and their own ways to soothe themselves and all of that stuff starts to come into place. Basically, they get to know who they are in a joyful way with nature. Oh, that, 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 is, that is beautiful. Yeah. Um, and the... And that's different than the, the regular kind of teaching paradigm we have, right? Where I have my agenda and your job now as students is to follow my agenda. You are giving tools and um, examples of thing to do, uh, things to do and then getting out of the way and letting them organically find their own path. I think uh, a lot of things are happening, but two basic ones that come into my mind right now is one, is that the children are learning sort of like a reciprocal kind of biophilia where they're learning the love of the land and that the land needs them to love them back. It's like the, lo the land loves them and they love the land kind of relationship. Um, that's a term I coined. So I, I, you'll, know, you'll not find it any place <laughs> from my work. You said and, reciprocal um, biophilia? Reciprocal biophilia. It's all like sim symbi symbiotic biophilia. Like we breathe the trees and the trees breathe us. I We're out there that. together. It's about deep connections and, and the, the beauty and all of that. And then what was the other thing? Um, I don't know, it skipped my mind. I have to write things down or I don't remember anything. Um, so sometimes, yeah, sort of th th so think about your, your own program. It makes me th sort of think about the different degrees of structure in different parts of things that you do. Um, in Richard Louv's book, Last Child in the Woods, he makes a really strong case for exactly what you're talking about based on mountains of evidence. Mm -hmm. That one of the best things that we can do is this free structured, you know, even unsupervised if possible, free play in nature. I remembered what I was going to say, which is exactly that. So play, uh, what, what's happening when children play is we, the adult or the teacher, have to trust that the environment will teach the child, because it will, whatever they're going to touch, they're going to learn from, and the child is competent to learn. So it's, a, it's, it's all of that. It's trust. Mm. I love that. Yeah. So I, I like to sort of think of in my programs, when I have a program, that there, there are, in, in addition, so you can think of like the energy scale, right? But mm -hmm. you're also talking about this, the, the structure scale. And there are times when, you know, a structured activity, try this in this way, 
is going to teach some transferable skills and is going to be useful. Sometimes, you know, that a little bit of structure and then you get to riff on it is going to take you places. And sometimes that no structure at all, because them actually being able to engage with something on their own terms and getting to make the rules is part of childhood mm -hmm. and decision making and peer to peer um, competencies. And that's building your relationship with nature. If all of your relationship with nature is dictated through somebody telling you what to do and when to do it, then that's not really a relationship with nature that you found. So I think of making time for all of those different energies. I find that when I'm introducing nature journaling to people at the start, that more structure is useful. I find that if I just go out and say, everybody, like, here's your nature journal, go, go draw. Then the kids who like to draw, they're like, hey, and they draw, sometimes they'll just like draw that symbol of a rose that they always do. Um, and so I'll give more of a structured activity that gets people kind of focusing and noticing something. And then we kind of back up from that and everybody looks at other people's stuff and we see that like, oh, all of these are totally different. So there is a lot of room to wiggle in this. <laughs> and what are the transferable skills that you can apply to this the next time. So now when I go out with my kids at the start, I scaffold a ton of stuff from them. And then they filled up their little bat girl utility kits with their utility belts with all these different tools. Like sometimes I'm gonna make a cross section. Sometimes I'm gonna make a map. Sometimes I can make a haiku. Sometimes I can do a landscapito. Sometimes I can um, rub the rock on the other rock and make paint out of the rocks because you've just got more of a toolkit that you can use. And then in that un totally unstructured time, I can, we can now say, we can kind of go out into the woods and say like, all right, um, let's go do some nature journaling. I'm gonna be over here and let's get back together in 45 minutes and see what we found. And they go, okay, daddy. And then we come back and there's different stuff. Um, so that would be sort of more of a medium structured thing. And then there's other times, you're right, when we're down, the journals are in a pile and they're in the backpacks and you can get them out if you want to. Or you could be building a rock castle in the middle of the creek. Um, or trying to shimmy across that log. Is, is this connecting with what you're... Definitely. It's, I mean, I just, I just fell into your work yesterday um, from the sketchbook revival. Mm -hmm. So I just learned about your journaling. And while you were talking and saying, take paper to take pencil to paper and write down what you, I was already writing notes from your, from, from, and then this morning, the newspaper was filled with bird pictures and I just drew them in my sketchbook. So oh. I'm already, Re I'm already connected to you without you even knowing it. And without my even knowing who you were, it's oh, like, woo, <laughs> this energy is like, <laughs> so oh. I, I totally understand what you're saying. And I think that um, there are these two paths that need to come together. And can I just share with you just on the side? I feel like I'm an intruder. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. This is, this is actually why we're here. This is good. Okay, this is good. my son-in-law, his name is, um, Greg Mercer, he has just um, created this thing called Chronicles for the Cre Chronicles for the Cre Oh, Chronicles of I can't remember it now. Uh, Chronicles for the Curious, and he's working with a um, he's the art director with a person who's creating like scenarios of how art and science come together. It's right up your alley. This, you might even know him. This <laughs> sounds cool. I've written it. So Greg Mercer, Chronicles of the Curious. Yeah. Um, and they're having a program tonight on birds and another one on next Wednesday. I think you can just go to Chronicles. It's in Seed and, seed and Search. Is that something? Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe uh, we'll, we'll have some of our, our, our people uh, who are watching this call um, uh, drop into, see if anybody if, can find a link to this online and put that into the chat. I can go on to mine. I'll find it and get it to you guys. Um, and that, that, sounds, that sounds really useful. Just um, started a week ago. 
So um, our so we have now um, ideas about kind of the, the the slider of energy level, the slider of um, of con, uh, teacher directed versus um, learner directed activity. Um, any other thoughts on the intersections of these ideas? Um, I'm going to jump over here to Linda. Um, hey, Linda. Hey there. Oh, unmute myself just a second. No, we can hear you. We can hear you loud. Hey. Sometimes, sometimes you never, never know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, All righty. Uh, first, the first thing that came to mind was when you, you Jack, were telling the uh, initial story of your um, watch, trailing the lady who was a sketcher when your mother was out and you were in the family and, and, and then later, uh, and, and that just sparked you so much. And then later your mother supplies you with a sketchbook. And then I'm imagining your curiosity fired you to keep on going. And so, um, Sometimes I'm finding that if I just am showing my sketchbook to just people when they're asking me what I've been doing, I started keeping the nature, the more serious nature journal during this year of COVID. And so many people began to like, well, how did you do that? What are you doing? What are, and so first it just had to be this like, like candy something. I mean, somebody's doing like your assignment says or something. I mean, so you, you're putting down this breadcrumb trail and go, wow, you know, I think I could do that. And then, and then, uh, so that's the beginning thing, like that little like sparkle thing. Then after that, then what you're saying, like I'm sharing these, these uh, techniques, the techniques came, you know, like as I began to, you know, like, well, I just, I just need to go along for the ride for a little while. And then it would gather some techniques and then get my imagination going to doing some other fresh things. And then, then I would do these fresh things and what, and people would come around and say, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and they go, oh, I think I can do that. And so I think that the, the, that you're like part of it is like you're just out there doing something fun and people are simon says it they they just want to do like what you're doing because it looks like it's fun you know uh and then after that you share a couple of things and then that's your like when you're talking about the curriculum at the beginning if the kids are kind of like wow they're kind of like already a little bit jazz then they are like all into like try it out i mean what's the harm of you know trying that out and so anyway um I'm just kind of reinforcing what you're saying with uh, your own story back at you. And then the spark of like how it real it is. I mean, how natural it is. Anyway, thanks. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I agree with you, Linda. Something I think that is, that's, that's, that makes teaching people about nature journaling easy is that authentically it's useful and people quickly look at it and they kind of go like, okay, I'm on board with this. Yeah. I don't have to do a hard sell, right? No I, no, I don't have to force you to do it. I, I can say like, look at this. This is what I'm doing. Um, here's a pen and paper. Do you want to try it? And that's right. And there they go. And and, 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 and to go even further with, along that road, because one of the things you've done that has been really great is saying, well, hey, just use the ballpoint pen. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything hard. Just get your typing paper out. I mean, anything to kickstart you, like get, I know it's, it's so great. And so, and so as low bar like, for entry, right? That's right. That's right. I mean, you just, you just move it around and see what happens and get those pencil miles going. So, uh, uh, and so I think that, um, that the the jumping in the water is the first thing, and then after that you go maybe I could do a map map. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And then you then the beauty of some of the things on your website are you have these fifteen minute chunks that people can because they go hour. I don't think I'm going to do that, but fifteen <laughs> minutes. And then and then I get that little bit of knowledge. I'll do that, and then I'm sharing it with somebody like no, it's not that hard. You know what? Are you, what are you doing? You know, so, so what are you worried about? <laughs> Uh, you're going to make a mistake, throw the paper away and start again, you know, no biggie. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so making it simple and easy and accessible, and then you get this breakthrough. I'm like, oh my gosh, this spark of energy, like I can do this now. <laughs> and then you're applying it to other things that are not even looking at nature. You're looking at maybe a problem you're solving or taking notes or, or just, or something in your imagination, you just need to get on paper. So it turns out to be very, very versatile and also paying attention to the life around you is so much make your you make your yourself bigger and calmer and this more uh, engaged curious being okay that's enough for now <laughs> yeah no, I, I i agree with you people I, I know that experience where people will um they'll walk along the trail they'll see you doing it and then they'll stop they'll do kind of a double take what are you doing and yeah. you know if you are doing a landscape they will stop they will then look at that landscape if you're sketching yeah. a flower, they'll stop and they'll look, oh, wow, that is a really pretty flower. That's right. And it's because also part of it is that you, by, by you're giving attention to that, you've created a little signpost along the side of the trail that says scenic viewpoint. <laughs> That's right? right. Even better than that, Jack, you are, um, you're uh, infecting people with the excitement of like, wow, yeah. <laughs> the world, you know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Very often, if I'm doing a class on nature journaling at a school, what I'll do is I'll just go over to my closet with a big cardboard box, throw a bunch of journals into it, arrive at the school, the kids come into the class, and there's a journal sitting there on the table. I say, open it up and look at that. And then yeah. they start opening it up, and then these little start, these side conversations going like, oh, look at this, look at this, oh, I got it, look at this, look at this. Right? And then we go like, you know, so this is, then I say like, hi, I'm John Mirlaz, I'm a scientist, this is what I do. And this is my brain on paper, that's what you've been looking at. And does that look cool? You want to do that? And they're like, yeah, okay, let me tell you, show you how. And then, boom, there's buy-in. That's right. Um, so you, you, it, it makes, I think it's really easy for people to figure out like, oh, this is relevant, right? That's right. Um, but but the, the other piece then is we want to, in order to get people to do it, we want it to be both relevant and also accessible. That's so right. if people think it has to be um, this, you know, grand art piece, and they don't self-identify as an artist. Um, how do you how do you kind of get everybody to go like, oh, you know, not just are the tools easy for entry, but the skill set that I have is 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 um, adequate and sufficient for being able to do this. That's right. And it will improve with practice, with deliberate practice, I'm gonna get better at this. And when people see that, so that, that, that you can go in and start doing this now, and you can see that, and I do this, and I'm gonna be getting better. That's right, that's right. In, in fact, the, the improvement scale, the improvement curve is pretty, I mean, you can improve really quickly yeah. if you just decide you wanna try. Uh, and so first, I think the candy or the, the, the thing that, the, just to get people to fall, because if I say, tell my grandson, hey, let's do citizen science. He goes, no, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but if I, can, if I can make it into a story that we're like, well, look at the bugs and whatever. And, and what, once we saw these ants and they were migrating and I go, well, the princess ant is going to this other place. And, and he goes, wow, wow. And, and then, and they goes, he goes, and all those males are following her. And, and I go, yeah, but it was so hilarious because they, 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 you know, they're looking at the world from a total, you know, from their, you know, whatever, wherever they're at. And so to be open and say, well, you know, I don't know. She's an aunt. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, to, but, you know, the story, it, you know, links in whatever. I'm, I'm getting sidetracked here. So <laughs> really well, well, let, let, let's bring um, Ayoka in on this. Um, <laughs> and um, the uh, either to, to dovetail into what we've been talking about here or to add a different piece. Um, tell us what's on your mind and, 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 uh, and what you're seeing. What more can we say? Yeah, I'm kind of, I was kind of sparked by what you talked about a, a few minutes ago, uh, which is, so I'm not teaching nature journaling, but I uh, have worked for a long time as a speech therapist and also with handicapped kids in the school. And um, what I, my point was that, um, if the kid, so I was writing stuff down and drawing stuff with the kids to also tell the teacher. And if, it, if, it, if the kid kind of at a, at a point, the kid realizes, oh, what I'm, this is what is on paper is something that is 
valuable and I can use this com to communicate uh, something that I experienced. And it, it, will, it will happen over time, especially with kids that have difficulties, but it's a, to, to make a valid, to, and, and to be excited about what, what is on the paper and make it a, a, a big thing, I think helps kids with, um, having, with having difficulties to sit down. Also, I used games for like, I had a kid with Down syndrome and to learn words in speech therapy, she was very active and she was very, very coordinated. So we used like a, we had like a cushion to sit on and it would, we, we would use it as a Frisbee and she invented that kind of game. So we we'd each had each have the words and we'd say the word, throw the Frisbee, then the other one had to say the word they had and throw the Frisbee and things like that too. If you have one-to-one -one time, it's not in a class situation, but if you have one-to-one -one time, you can you can kind of invent ideas to, or, or we would we would have cards on the on the floor and then step to the next card, step to the next card, or kind of see how long the word is by stepping on different things on the floor and who wins, who has the longest word. And you can incorporate these kinds of ideas um, in nature journaling for sure, or have that active kid measure how long something is and, and measure in steps so that they have to move. Yeah. That's right. Um, so you are, not using a cookie cutter one way of teaching fits all you're paying attention to those students and yeah, you can't you can't with this those kinds of kids there's no yeah. cookie cutter that's that shape <laughs> yeah they're gonna they're gonna have their own shape yeah. um the and you also sort of um touched into authenticity um where they they kind of look at it and they they look at what you're doing on the paper with the pictures and the words and they're like oh I see, if, if I can see that this is, is authentically useful to me, I want, I want in. And also, if I see that you as the adult are being authentic with me in your interactions, um, you know, when, that's like when you look at it at a student's journal page and um, you can give feedback about like where you get really excited about the observations that they made. Um, it's so much more meaningful and connecting than feigning excitement about a piece of artwork that um, you have seen better, right? But you can be completely authentic about like, like, whoa, look at you oh yeah aren't the hairs on the stem of this thing crazy and i hadn't noticed that they're the longest where the leaf attaches what a cool you know and you you go off on on that your interaction around the journal is totally authentic the the motivation to do the journaling is totally authentic they see you doing it too so it's not just you know here's an activity that I want you as the student learner to do, right? Um, also, if they if they produce something and then they can show it off and they have yeah. something that is like they made it, it gives that sort of feeling of being able to do things and and being validated in a different way. Yeah, I, I think of nature journalers as makers, mm -hmm. right? We are we are. Um, so we're not, how can we not just be a consumer, right? But be in there as, as, a, as a real maker and kind of to engage with your brain and the world through the nature journal. I, I think that, that that takes us there. It does. Um, is there anybody else, perhaps somebody who hasn't had an opportunity to um, share anything yet, um, or if you often are, find yourself quiet on these forums and think that I, I, I want to invite everybody to sort of feel welcome to share your thought, um, whether you're a first timer or a, a long timer. Um, is there somebody who hasn't had a chance to participate yet who would like to? If so, you can use the raise hand function or just turn on your camera and wave at me. And um, Catherine, hey. hey there. 
Um, I am, I'm loving this conversation, um, but I have another question I'm kind of curious about, which is going in a totally different direction. Um, but I am, I'm sort of interested in a metaphysical idea about what exactly it is that we're doing here together on Zoom. <laughs> um, and I'm really fascinated with the idea that we're, we're talking about connecting with nature and understanding the natural world, yet we're sitting in front of computers talking to each other in little boxes all across the world which I think is great, but I, I just, you know, I, I, I'm interested in, in hearing what other people think about this. Um, I um, had some work I did last year with kids sort of on the same topic and it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it was when we were all just sort of completely at a loss. Um, and so I found myself teaching online for the first time, which was really weird and then having kids work um, in individual sit spots, doing drawings and then uploading them and showing them to me on a computer. Um, so I, I'm just interested in, in the whole idea of nature journaling through all this Zoom interface and all this technology and kind of how, how it's changed the community that you've built Jack, um, and how you see sort of things going forward once everybody gets out of their their little square. <laughs> right. <laughs> our, our Brady Bunch little. Yeah, that's thing. right, the, the, the Brady Bunch square square. That, well, Catherine, that is a really interesting thought. Um, perhaps what we could do is just, um, we can I can we can address that briefly because we're, we're we will be closing this this round shortly, um, but that is a really interesting discussion. Um, and um, or actually, you know what we might do? Um, why? Um, what about for the topic of next week's Nature Journal Educators Forum? Um, the uh, the topic being. Um, the metaphysics of nature journaling on Zoom, and what next, um, and and kind of uh, delve into that with um, some some more time and thought. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, I I um, I don't want to co-opt an entire session. Oh, oh no no no! I, I think it it, it sounds. It, I think that it's also relevant because we are going to be coming out of mm -hmm. this. In period of intense isolation and change. And perhaps what we can do um, is sort of the, the theme might be something along of uh, along the lines of, you know, we, we've we've had our shots and now what? Right? Um, and to use it as a chance for reflection on what we want the community to be like, how to connect um, in a, if there is a post-COVID environment, we hope, um, what we want that to look like so that we can be intentional about making that be um, not just whatever it forms into, but perhaps directing that to be, um, take some of the, the best lessons from this this COVID break and I use that to inform what we do going forward. I think that that could be a really interesting topic. Um, I'm gonna jump over to the gallery view um, and just sort of look at people's faces. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you think that would be a, an interesting uh, topic. Um, seeing a number of, of, of thumbs up here. Um, yeah, let's, so um, Catherine, let's do that. Um, let's figure out what we want to do to, um, you know, we can kind of break down about this. This has been strange meeting each other through these little boxes. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I feel like I should uh, give a slight disclosure here, which is that I'm uh, working on a master's in education. So I might be um, incorporating some of what I learn into a paper that I'm writing. 
Th that is absolutely fair. And um, anything that you share, we will be incorporating into our teaching practices. Yes. So yes. When it goes uh, it's around, comes around. That's right. Yeah. It, it, it's 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 fluid. Like all the idea, I don't think that I don't think like the ideas that I have are ideas that are generated in other people's minds and have been rolling around and like our ideas and concepts form by this kind of interaction. And so I don't have any, there, there's no propriety of like, like this is my thought and you can't use my nature journaling thought. And uh, the, uh, so it's, it's I, I think of this kind of form, this is, this, think of this as open source. And, uh, but yeah, thank you for the disclosure. And, and, and by the way, anybody who says good ideas on this forum, expect other people to be using them. Well, I mean, I think this is the way forward in education. I think really, I mean, it was probably already happening, but now because of the pandemic, I think we've all learned how to be, to form these communities where we educate each other. Um, and, and going forward, I just think it's really, really interesting to think about it and how how it's changed the way we we view teaching and learning i think so all right well we've got a plan for next week i can't wait for next week's discussion and i hope to see all of you there um thank you for participating into today's discussion at some point uh going forward we will have our our special guest back um, sorry that uh, she was not able to join us for for this workshop. Um, before we wrap, um, uh, we're going to see if there's any community announcements or thoughts. I'm going to turn the floor over to Avea, the mad botanist. And um, I love the subtext there. And hey there. Hey there. Um Okay, so I, I really quickly wanted to give one more idea about um, about uh, kids who are active, and that's incorporating messy play into your nature journal. So letting the kid draw with twigs that they find on the ground, or maybe taking ink and and putting the leaf in the ink and then putting it on their journal, and making prints like that, or maybe playing in mud and then tracing with mud in the journal. Just a quick idea, incorporating messy play. Okay, so community announcements. Um, <laughs> um, we have, let's see here tonight, um, Marley Pfeiffer is having his nature journal show at six. And the fun thing about that is if you go onto his YouTube, you can chat live with other nature journalers, um, while, while the show is going. Um, so it's always kind of fun to, to like more, more community, more, more time to hang out with each other. Um, tomorrow we have raptors in flight, wait, raptors part two with the, with the bent wings. Yeah. That's right. This will be Raptors part three. Part three. Yes, that's right. And then um, Friday at nine, Saturday at three, we have Pencil Miles and Chill. Everybody, as always, is invited to join us and just hang out, chat, and draw, and get access to the coveted book list. And um, Saturday morning, Brian Hickenbotham at 10 is having Marley, JP, and Lori um, visit so that they can do a watercoloring workshop with him. On Sunday morning is Melinda and the Monterey Bay Nature Journal Club. And Monday at um, at five is gonna be the eighth and final uh, plant family. And then a party will be the week after where we kind of just look at all of the plant families and plant families in our foods. Um, so those are all of the community ones I can think of. Also, because we're all educators here, if anybody wanted to be um, somebody who is like a nature journal mentor, there's a list on Jack's website where you can sign up to offer to be mentors for other people. Um, and I will post that in a second as well. Speaking of, of, of um, connecting, there's a map where you can see what nature journal clubs are closest to you or start one of your own. So I'm gonna recommend people check those out. And thank you, that is all my announcement. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, there's, there's a lot of really wonderful stuff going on in this community. Um, and, uh, and I want to encourage everybody to, to, to take part in that. Um, and, uh, uh, Deborah, I, I hope that your husband might be able to join us in next week's discussion, um, uh, to discuss part of the, the stuff that he's figured out in the book that he's done, um, on this topic.
Yeah, I, um, I will ask him. Now that could be a lot of fun. Um, well, I, this is this is great. Um, thank you all for joining us today, and uh, we we really look forward to probing. Um, we're, we're we're trying to figure out what are best practices in nature journal education, and we are um, together mapping that territory. And I think it's through having discussions exactly like this that we, um, by articulating these thoughts and ideas, um, it, that it, that it really comes comes together. So thank you, folks, very much, and I really look forward to seeing all of you again. Um, in the meantime, be safe, get your journaling on, and consider sort of taking on the mantle of, of, of a nature journal mentor. The next time that somebody sees um, you with your nature journaling, um, is it possible that you can inspire and perhaps open a door for them of how this, um, how this can be done? Folks, thank you so much. And um, I look forward to playing with you all again. Bye-bye.